Hey guys, it's Greg with Apple Explained, and today we're going to explore the history of one more thing, which is a phrase used near the end of some Apple keynotes to generate excitement before announcing a new product or service. Now this topic was the second place winner of last week's voting poll, and if you didn't get to vote, make sure you're subscribed. That way the voting polls will show up right in your mobile activity feed, and you can let me know which video you'd like to see next. So in this video, I want to show every moment where the iconic phrase one more thing was used during an Apple announcement. Now it was Steve Jobs who began this tradition back in 1999 at the Macworld Expo, and I should mention that today, October 5th, is the seven year anniversary of Steve Jobs' passing. So in honor of his memory and incredible legacy, I want to dedicate this video to him. So let's get started and take a look at the history of one more thing. And we think we've got the strongest product lineup that Apple's ever had. So thank you for coming today and checking this out with us. And we're very, very pleased to introduce this to you. And, uh, oh, wait a minute now. Uh, there is one more thing. There is one more thing that I want to show you. Um, We make some great displays for the new Power Mac G4. We have our 15-inch flat panel studio display and our 17-inch and 21-inch CRT-based studio displays. And they work great with the G4. They're color-coordinated to match. But what would be the ultimate companion for the new Power Mac G4? Well, let me show you. This is called the Apple Cinema Display. We now have the best consumer desktop on the planet. And I really want to thank you for coming here and seeing it with us today. We're really, really proud of it. Everybody's worked really hard on it. So thank you. Oh, wait a minute, though. Wait a minute. I forgot. There is one more thing. I forgot to tell you about. This is really important. In addition to the iMac, we have a second model called the iMac DV. What does DV stand for? Digital Video. The iMac Digital Video. What is this? Well, the iMac DV is everything in iMac and a lot more. Let me tell you the more. 400 megahertz processor, even faster. 10 gig drive, even bigger. RGB video out, built into every one. This is a key feature for our education customers. So, sort of on the bottom, headed for the back, there's a little ventilation grill on the bottom. Looks like this. You can pop it out very easily and expose the connector. And we even ship another nice little grill you can pop in, and then you can just hook right onto it. So everybody who needs RGB out, built into every single unit. So we are incredibly thrilled with the new iMac TV, and we are so far ahead of anybody now in the consumer desktop space, it's not funny. So thank you very much for coming today. We've had a lot to show you. Thanks for sitting through a long presentation. Oh, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I do have one last thing I forgot to tell you about. We just told you about iMac DV. One last thing, iMac DV. Special Edition. <laughs> the iMac DV Special Edition is everything in iMac DV and more. 
the more is 128 megabytes of memory standard, a 13 gigabyte drive standard, and an amazing new special color. I'd like to show you that now. Can we please show you the iMac DV Special Edition. It's the most beautiful iMac ever. and a brand new color for iMac, graphite. <clears throat> Come on over here. So this is the architecture, except there's one more thing. The one more thing is we have been secretly, for the last 18 months, designing a completely new user interface. And that new user interface builds on Apple's legacy and carries it into the next century. And we call that new user interface Aqua because it's liquid. One of the design goals was when you saw it, you wanted to lick it. <laughs> and so we call it Aqua. And this is the architecture for Mac OS X. And we are incredibly, incredibly excited and pleased with how this has turned out. Now, when we talk about user interfaces, um, let me show you. This is it. No. <laughs> um, this, this is what started it all, right? The original Macintosh in 1984, 512 by 384, dots on the screen, black and white, kicked off a revolution. And, uh, we saw others follow in the late 80s. Uh, this is Windows 3.1 in the late 80s. And uh, Apple followed up in the mid-90s with the current user interface called Platinum, still the best thing out there. And, uh, and then this is Windows 98, which uh, obviously came out in 98. So these are the user interfaces out there. They're all credible. They all work. How do we take this to the next level? Well, let me show you a few slides on Aqua, and then I'd like to demonstrate it for you. So this, you get a little feeling for what Aqua may be like. But there's one more thing. <laughs> this is our product strategy that we announced about two and a half years ago. The four quadrants. And it served us very well. We filled them all in and we've even had a chance to go around and update most of them two or three times each to constantly keep them fresh and aggressive. But today, for the first time in two and a half years, we are expanding our product strategy. And it's not a portable. It is a new desktop machine. What is it? We are combining the power of the Power Mac G4, the awesome power of this machine, with the desktop elegance the silence and the miniaturization that we learned from doing the IMAX to make a whole new class of machine. And so, we're starting with the G4 power. We're building in a really fast G4 chip into this new machine. We're building in the ability to have up to a gigabyte and a half of memory in the machine. We're building in the ability to have up to 40 gigabytes of storage inside the machine. We're adding I.O. for everything. A modem, 100 megabit per second Ethernet, USB, and Firewire. You can hook up to almost anything with this machine. And airport wireless networking inside as well. Now, I know some of you are saying, well, looks like a mid-range Power Mac G4 to me. What's so new and special about this? Well, this is where we get in to the iMac magic. Because if this is the size of a Power Mac G4. We have miniaturized all that power into something this size. Okay? From this to this. And what we've miniaturized it into is an eight inch cube. An eight inch cube. Unbelievable. Another way of looking at this is, if this is the Power Mac G4 and you could break it into four equal parts, 
We have miniaturized all the power into just one of those parts, which is an eight inch cube. Unbelievable. Now, you can imagine with all this power in such a dense space, we must need a turbo fan to cool this thing. But no, our engineers have done some brilliant work and all this power in an eight inch cube has cooled without a fan. And so it runs in virtual silence in an eight inch cube. And we call this new product the Power Mac G4 Cube, or more affectionately, the G4 Cube. You guys have sat through a lot, and I really appreciate it today. And uh, there is one more thing. <laughs> one more thing, if I could uh, beg your patience, another few minutes. I'll give you a clue. Anybody get it? Remember high school chemistry? Okay. Let's talk notebooks. We have the most powerful notebooks in the world. But they have the sex. Right? They have the sex. We want both. We want both. The power and the sex. Right? So today we're introducing a totally new power book. It's got the power. 500 megahertz G4, our first G4 power book ever. If that's not enough, this next one's going to blow your mind. 15.2 inch mega wide screen. <clears throat> Built in DVD. Five hour battery life. Airport ready. So these are the kind of power features you'd expect from us. Firewire ports, et cetera, et cetera. All that stuff. But what about the sex? <laughs> Sitting down? <laughs> One inch thick. One inch thick. 5.3 pounds. And this again. What is this? Titanium. It's made out of titanium. Like the spy planes. This, this is an incredible material. It's stronger than steel, yet lighter than aluminum. It's unbelievable. And this isn't, you know, IBM's talked about titanium, but they just throw a little titanium powder into the plastic. It's nothing. This is real commercial grade titanium metal like they build airplanes out of. Titanium. We think we got the power and the sex in our new PowerBook G4 Titanium. And as you can see, I'd like to show it to you. <laughs> this thing's pretty remarkable. Ready? Voila. Got video here? There we go. This is it. It is remarkable. Let me open it here. Look at this. It's incredible. Let me just show you how thin this is. That's my finger. Okay? I want you to go down and show them the side. Look at this thing. It's unbelievably beautiful. But there was, wait a minute, there is one more thing I forgot about. Uh, that's the iMac. I wanted to talk about the iMac for just a minute. 
The iMac has been really great for us. I think customers just love them with the flat screen, the super crisp flat screen displays, the really fast G4 processors, and the super drives. You can burn your own DVDs that play in consumer DVD players. And its design is just stunning, where you can move the display anywhere you want. And the feedback we've gotten on this has been fantastic. Walt Mossberg, not an easy journalist to please, said, the new flat panel iMac is the best consumer desktop PC on the market and costs less than a Windows PC with the same specs. He said that last month. So we're really happy with the iMac. I've got some fun data to share with you. We sell three models. The high-end one has a super drive in it. And burn your own DVDs, as I said. I'm really pleased to report that the percentage of all the Macs sold with a SuperDrive, 50%. Customers want the SuperDrive. It is the most requested thing we've got in the iMac line in terms of give me one with a SuperDrive. It's showing up in the sales stats. And that model sells for $18.99. As of today, we're lowering the price back down to $17.99 so we can try to reach even more people with it. But this doesn't address the number one request we've gotten for the iMac. The number one request is for a larger display. And the iMac's got a fantastic 15-inch display, but today we are introducing a model with a 17-inch landscape display. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. It is gorgeous. It's really beautiful. It's giant. And again, you can move it anywhere you like, even when it's twirling. There is one more thing we wanted to talk about today. Now, some of you may have noticed on the net <laughs> this. For those of you uh, that have not been aware, there was a funny thing that happened on our website last Thursday, as I recall, uh, where some specifications were posted on a Power Mac G4 page that looked pretty remarkable. Now, the reaction to these specifications fell into one of three camps. One, it's too good to be true, can't be true. Nothing could ever be this good. Number two, uh, it's true. And number three, it's brilliant marketing on Apple's part. <laughs> uh, we internally, one of the folks internally had a great name for this. He called it premature specification. <laughs> but I, I am here today to tell you that it was a mistake and it's true. But it doesn't even begin to tell the story that we get to tell you right here and now. We are delivering today the world's fastest personal computer. It's amazing. Now, there's three things. There's the chip, there's the system, and there's the product. And we're calling it the G5. So, the 17-inch PowerBook. We just took another giant leap. There is one more thing. It's one more small thing. When we were inventing all of the technology to build this, tremendous technology to be able to do this, it's way far ahead of what anyone in the industry is capable of doing. We decided to apply that technology to something a little smaller, which is this. Yeah. Want to see that again? A new 12 inch power book that is only 1.2 inches thick, weighs 4.6 pounds. It is the smallest power book ever, even smaller than the duos, if you remember those. It is the smallest full-featured notebook in the world. New 12-inch power book, and 
I happen to have one right here. There it is. The iPod Mini is designed to go after this, the high end of the flash market, and we think it's going to do very well doing exactly that. There's just one more thing about the iPod Mini, which is it comes in colors. So in addition to silver, we have gold, we have blue, we have pink, and we have green. So we have a whole family of colors with the iPod Mini. Now these are aluminum, and they're anodized aluminum, so the photography doesn't really do it justice. You go out and see these in the booth, they are gorgeous. So we're very, very excited about that. So these two things and many more are why we believe we have just begun this era of digital music and uh, that we're going to see some, some very healthy progress in the next year. We're very, very excited about it. iPod and iPod Mini. <laughs> but there is one more thing. <laughs> there is one more thing that we want to tell you about today. It's pretty great. So let's look at iPod market share. And let's go back a year in time. Let's go back to January 2004, a year ago. iPod's market share was about 31%. Flash music players had a share of 62%. And the iPod wannabes were about 7%. That was a year ago. Now, a year ago, we introduced a new product called the iPod Mini to go after the high end of the Flash market. Well, it's a year later. How'd we do? January 2005. I am pleased to report that the iPod's market share has doubled to 65%. The Flash market share has been cut in half to 29%, and the wannabes are down a percent to 6%. In one year, very rarely, you get a before and after snap like this. The iPod mini worked. So, what's next? Well, we'd like to go after the remaining mainstream flash market. <laughs> so we've taken a look at this market, and it's a zoo. There's a zillion little flash players. And the market's incredibly fragmented. Nobody has very much market share. Nobody's investing, marketing, and growing the market. The products are all pretty much the same. So let's just take a look. We can pick one of them and take a look. They all have some attributes. First of all, <laughs> they, most of them are powered by AAA batteries, which are not rechargeable. So what that means is you're going to feed this thing about $100 worth of batteries a year. Not such a good investment. But let's even forget about the batteries for now. The real key here is that these products are trying to be as easy to use as an iPod, but they've got these very tiny displays and no click wheels. They just got these little buttons. And the result is a real tortured user interface. They're really hard to use. They're hard to find your music. You're sitting there trying to navigate around these things, and it's a lost cause. Well. We don't want to make another one of these. There's plenty of them. We want to make something that's really great if we're going to enter this market. We want to make something that's even easier to use than the existing iPods. Because if this is going to be our entry level product, we want to bring even more people in to the digital music revolution. This is not the way to go. So we noodled on this for a while. And we realized we, we had to come up with a, a, a new original idea that would make a product that was way better than this, where you didn't have to tortured user interfaces to listen to your music. And then we saw it. It was clear as a bell. Something happened in the iPod market with all of our iPod users last year. They discovered a new way to listen to their music that became the most popular way that iPod users listen to their music. And what is that? Shuffle. 
With shuffle, you don't have to find your music. It shuffled up for you. And we decided to base a flash bass player around shuffle. And so today, we are introducing the iPod Shuffle. And this is what it looks like. It's unbelievable. And it is so great to use. So iTunes 6, that is Act 3. But we do have one more thing today. One more thing. It's a pretty big thing. You know, we've talked about how you can buy music videos off the store. You can subscribe to video podcasts off the iTunes Music Store. And you can buy Pixar short films. Well, there is one more thing that we're announcing today that you can buy off the iTunes Music Store. And that is TV shows. Now. So, this is what we're up to today. And I'm really glad you liked everything. Uh, but there is one more thing that I want to talk about. You know, there's been this pesky little problem of the power books. You know, it's not a secret that we've been trying to shoehorn a G5 into the power book and have been unable to do so because of its power consumption uh, being unrealistic in such a small package. We've done everything engineering uh, that was possible engineering wise. We've consulted every possible high authority, <laughs> you know. And one of the things we said when we were switching to Intel was it wasn't just about performance, it was about performance per watt. Because that was what was going to let us get these things into notebooks. So let's take a look at where we came out, performance per watt. If you take a look at the G4 chip that we have in the power books today, it's got 0.27 performance per watt. Now to put a G5 in, which has got a lot higher performance, we needed a higher performance per watt too, so that the power didn't go up with that performance. Well, it turned out that the G5 was even worse than the G4 in terms of performance per watt, which is what kept us from doing what we wanted to. But the Core Duo was designed for this from the start. Look at that. And so it is four times better than the G4 and four and a half times better than the G5. And so today we are introducing a new notebook computer that we are calling the MacBook Pro. It's a new name. It's a new name because we're kind of done with power and because we want Mac in the name of our products. So MacBook Pro. And this is the new MacBook Pro. It has an Intel Core Duo chip in it. The same as we're putting in the new iMac, which means that there are going to be dual processors in every MacBook Pro. But there is one last thing I'd like to talk to you about today. Now this, this next thing's a little unusual for us. It's a sneak peek of a product that will be announced in the first calendar quarter of 2007. We usually keep things pretty, pretty corralled until we're ready to ship them, but in this case, I think it completes the story. And to understand where we're going, I'd like you to get a sneak peek of this. So we decided to go ahead and, and show it to you today. So we've now got music and TV shows and audiobooks and movies and all sorts of great digital content on the iTunes store. And uh, you can take that content, again, whether it be music or TV shows or movies, let's focus on movies here, and you can purchase it and download it over the internet to your computer. It can be a Mac or a PC. I'm going to choose a Mac here because I'm biased, but that could be a PC too. <laughs> And you can take that content and enjoy it on your computer, whether it's a desktop or a notebook. 
and you can also sync it to your iPod. And it's really great. But what about that big screen flat TV you just bought last weekend? You'd love to be able to, say, watch your movies on that, right? So what are we going to do to complete this picture? Well, you need a box to drive that big screen TV to play movies. I mean, if you want to play DVDs, you've got to go out and buy a DVD player, right? Well, you've got to go out and somehow get a little iTunes player here to play this stuff. But how is this box going to talk to the computer? Do I want to string cables throughout my house? Because my computer is probably in my den or in my some other room in the house and my TV is in the living room or wherever it might be. So I'm going to talk to it using wireless networking. And that's going to get the content from my computer to this box from the box onto the TV. Make sense? Right? That's what we'd all like to do. We don't want to tear up our walls to string cables. So let's talk about this box. This is the missing piece. Well, here it is. This is what it looks like. And uh, internally, we call it ITV. It's going to let you enjoy your media on your big screen flat TV. Right? That's what it's for. Now, it's a code name internally, ITV. We've got to come up with a final name before we introduce it in the first calendar quarter of next year. We're just going to call it ITV. But there is one more little thing. Since we're all here today, there's one other thing we wanted to tell you about that we think you might like. One of the things we didn't have a chance to talk about so far is Safari. You know that Safari has been a wonderful success. There are now over 18 million Safari users. And if you look at Safari's market share, it has climbed from zero when we introduced it a few years ago to 5% across the entire internet. Now, if you look at the whole world of browsers, Internet Explorer's market share is about 78%. Firefox is about 15 Safari is 5 And other browsers are about 2 Well, we dream big. We would love for Safari's market share to grow substantially. That's what we'd love. Um, but how are we going to do that? Well, the Mac's market share is growing, and this is great. But we want to grow maybe even in addition to that. And to do that, we're going to have to create a version of Safari that runs on Windows. We have a little bit of expertise in doing that because of iTunes. And that's exactly what we have done. So these are some of the new products we wanted to introduce today. But there is one more thing. And of course, that one more thing is the MacBook. The MacBook is an amazing product. It is the best-selling Mac ever. We sell a ton of these MacBooks, and people love them. They are one of the, the best products in the industry. And uh, they sell for 10 dollars The entry price is $10.99. And we're going to keep right on selling these to a lot of people, but we're going to reduce the entry price today to $9.99, make them a little more affordable. And uh, I think we'll just keep on selling these for an awful long time. They're fantastic products. But... We've heard from a lot of MacBook customers, and the top three things they'd like in their MacBook are a metal enclosure. They lust after the MacBook Pro's metal enclosure. Faster graphics. Right? They want to play games. They, they are doing a lot of graphic-intensive applications uh, with photos and other things. They want faster graphics. And a lot of them want LED backlit displays for that instant-on and brighter displays. So these are the three top things we've heard, and we figured out a way to bring these to the MacBook line. And so we are introducing a new generation of MacBook on top of our white plastic MacBook, and here it is. Again, there it is. 
It's an all new MacBook. Again, corner to corner glass, LED backlit display. It is our new next generation MacBook. But we do have one more thing. And that is a video camera. You know, we've seen video explode in the last few years. Nowhere more than on YouTube, which is serving up a billion video streams a day. And where are these streams coming from? They're coming from folks like us who are using these portable solid state video cameras to take personal videos. And it's incredible. So here's one, very popular one. Four gigabytes of memory, $149. And this market's really exploded. And we want to get in on this. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to start off with eight gigabyte unit. Eight gigabytes of memory. And we're going to lower the price from $149 to free. This is the new Apple, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so how are we going to do that? The way in which we're going to do that is we're going to build a video camera right into the new iPod Nano. On the back of every Nano is a video camera and a microphone integrated right in. And there's a speaker inside as well to listen to the, music, to the, listen to the sound of your videos. So built into every iPod Nano is now an awesome video camera. And yet we've still retained its incredibly small size. And you realize how small when you compare this to other devices. Right? A fifth as thick, a tenth the volume. So you can take along your iPod Nano and always have your video camera with you. But there is one more thing. And I think it's best that I just show you. Now, I really want your Wi-Fi devices off. Are they off? <laughs> Please turn them off if you've turned them back on. So, in 2007, when we launched the iPhone, it was my privilege to make the first public call on stage to one of my best friends in the whole world, Johnny Arve, the head of our design team. And uh, I'd like to do the same on this occasion. So I'm going to go ahead and call Johnny now. Johnny? It, uh, this never freezes up, so you guys haven't turned off all your Wi-Fi. Come on, let's get it off, please. <laughs> hey, Johnny, how you doing? I'm good, I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing okay, except for these guys that aren't turning their Wi-Fi off. Isn't it? Yeah. You know, this is amazing. I uh, I grew up here in the U.S. with the with the Jetsons and and with uh, Star Trek and communicators, and just dreaming about this. You know, dreaming about video calling, and and it's real now. Yeah, did you did you I, have this I, kind I, of stuff um, in England? I, I grew up watching exactly the same TV shows. You know, I, I used to I, I used to love that that sort of wonderful, um, sort of optimistic view of the future, and uh, and it's real now, isn't it? It's real, especially when people turn their Wi-Fi stuff off. <laughs> <laughs> It 
sort of odd, isn't it? Because as you know, the, the idea of communicating this way, it's an old idea. It's one that we're we're familiar with. We've just had to wait. We've had to wait an awfully long time for it to become real, haven't we? Yeah. Well, listen. I uh, let's have lunch later on. All right. I'll see you soon. Thanks, Johnny. I right, see you soon. So, we call this FaceTime. FaceTime video calling. But we've got one more thing. Actually, it's one more hobby. Um, so, of course, we're talking about Apple TV. Now, we introduced Apple TV four years ago. And we've sold a lot of them, but it's never been a huge hit. And uh, nor is any other competitive product. Nothing's really hit in the living room yet. But we talk to people that use Apple TVs, and they love them. They absolutely love them and use them a lot. So what have we learned in the last four years? What have we learned from our users? Well, we've learned a lot. The first thing is, the number one, two, and three thing they want is they want Hollywood movies and TV shows whenever they want them. It's that simple. It's not really complicated. They want Hollywood movies and TV shows. They don't want amateur hour. They want professional content. And they want everything in HD. The HD revolution is over. It happened. HD won. Everybody wants HD. <laughs> They'd like to pay lower prices for content, right? More, the lower the prices, the more they're going to watch. They don't want a computer on their TV. They have computers. They go to their widescreen TVs for entertainment, not to have another computer. This is a hard one for people in the computer industry to understand, but it's really easy for consumers to understand. They get it. They don't want to manage storage. When you buy a bunch of movies and TV shows, you have to manage them because you don't want to throw them away. You just bought them. And so you have storage management problems. Your hard disk starts to fill up. What are you going to do? People don't want to think about managing storage. They just want to watch movies and TV shows. And they don't want to sync to a computer. Most of them haven't even figured out what that is. <laughs> they want to pull some content off their computer, but they don't want the syncing stuff. It's too complicated. And they want whatever hardware we have to be silent, cool, and small. Right? Not too hard to understand. So this is what we've learned. And it's, it's really quite a bit different than a lot of other companies think. And either we're right or we're wrong, but this is what we've heard from our customers. And so we've made something new for them. This is the current Apple TV. We are introducing the second generation of Apple TV today, and this is what it looks like. It's a fourth the size. You can hold it in the palm of your hand. I have one here, actually. I mean, look at this. That's it. It's this little tiny box. So this is, these are the things that we wanted to share with you today. We're really excited about them. But there is one more thing. And uh, that one more thing really comes back to our theme for today, which is back to the Mac. You know, we talked about this virtuous circle with Mac OS X helping to create iOS for our devices, that maturing, being on the iPod as well, and now being inspired by that, bringing some of that back to Mac OS X. But just like that philosophy has some benefit in our software, 
it can also have some benefit in our hardware. What would happen if a MacBook met an iPad? There's a lot to be inspired about there as well. Well, what are some of those things? An iPad has instant on. Right? That's pretty rare for a notebook. Great battery life. Amazing standby time. 30-day standby time. Solid state storage. So there's no optical or hard drives. And it's thinner and lighter, which means it's even more mobile. These are some great things for notebooks. And so we asked ourselves, what would happen if a MacBook and an iPad hooked up? <laughs> well, this is the result. It's one of the most amazing things we've ever created. It is our new MacBook Air, and we think it's the future of notebooks. We're really excited about this. It is gorgeous. Let me just show you a few beautiful shots of it. It's like nothing we've ever created before, and it's, it's really stunning. So that is iCloud. Now there's one more thing. No, nothing. A small thing. It pertains to iTunes in the cloud. As you recall, iTunes in the cloud is just for the music that you've purchased from the iTunes store. Now at 14 billion songs, 15 billion, excuse me, that's a lot of songs out there that have been purchased from iTunes Music Store. But you may have some that you ripped yourself. And there's three ways you can deal with that. One, you can sync your new devices over Wi-Fi or cable, or cable. And you only have to sync them once just to get that music on them. And then you can rely on iCloud to take care of getting all your new purchases off iTunes onto that device. Or if it's just a few songs you love that you don't want to leave behind, you can buy those songs that you'll miss on iTunes. And we're going to offer a third way, which is called iTunes Match. What is iTunes Match? Well, iTunes Match uses the fact that we've got 18 million songs now in the iTunes Music Store. And the chances are awfully good that we've got the songs in our store that you've ripped. And so we wrote software to scan those CDs, the, the ripped CD, the, the, the non-iTunes music, and match it up with those songs we have in the store. But we're not quite finished yet. We have one more thing. <laughs> we love to make great products that really enrich people's lives. We love to integrate hardware, software, and services seamlessly. We love to make technology more personal and allow our users to do things that they could never have imagined. We've been working incredibly hard for a long time on an entirely new product. And we believe this product will redefine what people expect from its category. I am so excited <laughs> and I am so proud to share it with you this morning. It is the next chapter in Apple's story. And here it is.
before we close this morning, we do have one more thing. I'd like to tell you about something that we've been working really hard on and something we are super excited about. Today we're announcing Apple Music, the next chapter in music, and I know you are going to love it. It will change the way that you experience music forever. But we're not stopping there. We do have one more thing. Now, we have great respect for these words, and we don't use them lightly. Our teams have been hard at work for years on something that is important to all of us, the future of the smartphone. The first iPhone revolutionized a decade of technology and changed the world in the process. Now, 10 years later, it is only fitting that we are here in this place on this day to reveal a product that will set the path for technology for the next decade. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. This is iPhone 10. It is the biggest leap forward since the original iPhone. So that is the history of One More Thing. And if you want to vote for the next video topic, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.